Hello everyone and welcome to my review of Tim Burns' Owls in Wonderland. Before I begin this review, I want to say three things. The first is I have not read Alice's Adventure in Wonderland, let alone Through the Looking Glass, so while I know this movie is a very loose adaptation, you only see me primarily talk about it as a standalone film. The second is, if anyone asks, will I review the sequel that came out six years after this movie was released? All I can say is, maybe, since I personally never saw it. And lastly, this review was requested by the lovely Azumanga Dio Fan 101 The link to her channel will be in the description. With that said, let's talk about the film, shall we? So the story is a sequel of sorts where Alice Kingsley, played by Mia Wasikowska, is all grown up or after she attends an unwanted engagement party. Eventually, Alice runs off for being asked to marry where she falls down the rabbit hole and returns to Wonderland. Only in this version it's called Underland, but whatever. After running into several characters including the White Rabbit, Tweedledee, Tweedledum, and even the Blue Caterpillar where they show her a scroll which prophesizes she would slay the Jabberwocky. Eventually, forces of the Red Queen capture many of them and bring them back to her castle, which, of course, the Red Queen, played by Helena Bonham Carter, and the Native of Hearts, played by Crispin Glover, want to prevent her from slaying the Jabberwocky. While all that is going on, the Cheshire Cat, played by Stephen Fry, leads her to the tea party of the Mad Hatter, played by Johnny Depp, where he explains how the Red Queen took power from the White Queen, and eventually the Red Queen's army captures him too. Now we're here to question, will Alice be able to rescue them all, and how could she slay the Jabberwocky? That's all the plot I'll mention, so it's time for me to talk about what I liked about this movie, what I did not like about this movie, some trivia my overall opinion on the film. While this movie does have some major problems, and trust me, we'll get to that later, let's talk about why I feel this film version of Alice in Wonderland got right. Right off the bat, I can safely say from a production standpoint, is very well done. The costume design I can easily praise as in the real world, they 100% nailed the look of Victorian England. And once we are in Underland, they completely match the character's appearance. Plus, the artwork does make the world of Underland feel like Tim Burton can only come up with in a good way. I could definitely see why they won the Academy Award in this field because I could see a lot of effort was put into that. Most of the acting is just alright, like with Crispin Glover as the Knave of Hearts and Anne Hathaway as the White Queen, but the problem is they weren't given enough to work with, and there is one performance you'll see me mention later. That said, there are three performances I like to point out that stood out to me. The first is, while it is a Johnny Depp show to an extent, and I don't think he does it badly, like with his voice, I do see some really faint hits of the Ed Wynn portrayal from the 1951 anime film with his own blend of quirkiness, which is pretty much Jack Sparrow, which, while I am listing Depp's performance as a positive here, I'd be lying if I didn't say it comes off as distracting sometimes. But who I feel steal the show in the acting department is Helena Bottom Carter's The Red Queen and Stephen Fry's The Cheshire Cat, but for different reasons. Helena Bottom Carter is just so over the top that I could tell she was having fun with the role, whereas Stephen Fry is very controlled and smooth when it comes to his line delivery, just how I can imagine a version of The Cheshire Cat being. The visual effects, for the most part, are well done. I say for the most part because there is one thing I'll comment on later that bugs me about the use of CGI. One example I will say is I love the design of the Cheshire Cat because it feels like if the Cheshire Cat was done by Tim Burton. Plus the effects of some of the other characters ranging from the Queen's Army to the March here and even the Dormouse look pretty good by 2010 standards. Lastly, while the script does tie into my biggest problem with this movie, I will say the idea of it being a quasi-sequel where Alice returns to Underland is actually not a terrible idea. I feel it has potential because when she first appears there, she is a child and you would obviously have a very different perspective, let alone imagination when you're an adult, so I feel that idea could have been interesting. While this film version does have some merit that I can't ignore, it's now time to talk about what I did not like about Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, and needless to say, there is quite a bit to talk about there. I think the weakest performance is from Mia Wasikowska. I just found it to be bland, which I don't blame her for it. The problem is, like with Crispin Glover and Anne Hathaway, she wasn't given much to work with in the script. Not helping matters is from what I saw on screen, either the character of Alice in this version is passive, 
or just a smart aleck with no real edge or likability to her, which gives me a hard time sympathizing, let alone relating with her, like when she is going to a ball where she was going to be asked in marriage, or when she is being the chosen one in the Battle of Underland. This is a minor complaint because a lot of the story is the stuff going around Alice, which is a lot more interesting than the character of Alice herself, but even so, she just didn't do it for me. While I said most of the visual effects are well done even by 2010 standards, I will admit them digitally elongating Crispin Glover's face, while I get the idea they are going for, it makes him look more silly than threatening because it feels so off. What makes it even worse, which ties into this point, is they use CGI a little too much, even on some moments where it's not necessarily needed. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against a big budget of movie using CGI, and it's very understandable why some things can only be accomplished through CGI. But some things I felt there were other ways to accomplish it, like the height of the Knave of Hearts. While using stilts in a mocap soup is one way, they could have also possibly used camera tricks to accomplish the same thing. I just feel like this movie shouldn't have to rely on CGI as much as they did. The directed by Tim Burton is not bad, but something about it just feels like it's by Tim Burton in name only, to where it could have been done by just about anyone, and not a whole lot of would have really changed. It's a shame that I'm saying this because, on paper, you would think Tim Burton would be a great choice to do a film adaptation of Alice in Wonderland with the imagery he is known to have. Now this point is short because it ties into my biggest problem with this film adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. The biggest problem I have with this movie is the story. Not the idea, but what we got in the end. I feel the idea of a grown-up Alice returning to Wonderland had a lot of potential to be interesting, especially when you consider Tim Burton is directing it. But the script makes it into an epic, which more feels like a super condensed Lord of the Rings. The issue here is, from what I understand of the original story of Alice in Wonderland, it's about rejoicing in imagination, a world without rules, and because it's from the mind of a child, it would make sense for the story to be incoherent or complete nonsense. This film, on the other hand, gives it logic, a three-act structure, and that goes against with what I understand of Alice in Wonderland is supposed to be. What makes it feel even more inconsistent is at times it'll feel like they become a film with no logic, like when the Red Queen sends a frog to death because basically he ate one of her tarts. Even if we took that out, and while it is watchable, at the same time it feels generic. Like I've seen the prophecy story it tells here but told much better. It doesn't do anything new to it, so it makes that feel tired. At the end of it, I'm just left wondering, was this really the best Linda Wolverton could do with the screenplay, make it into a big budget, unoriginal action film? It just feels like a shame that it had potential to be something unique, and the end becomes a story I've again heard before and told much better. Now for some trivia. As some of you should know by now, this movie was very loosely based on the 1865 novel Alice's Adventure in Wonderland, as well as incorporating bits of the 1871 sequel Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Alice in Wonderland won two Academy Awards, that being for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design. Not to mention it was up for Best Visual Effects, but lost to Christopher Nolan's Inception. This was actually the first Disney movie Tim Burton directed since leaving the company in the 1980s, which prior to being a director was an animator. Plus, from what I can find, this was part of a two-picture deal he made with Disney, which included him doing his animated remake of Frankenweenie. While Michael Sheen played the White Rabbit, according to IMDb, he was also going to play the Cheshire Cat, but he backed out due to scheduling conflicts. In the bonus feature in the DVD copy I own, they showed how Johnny Depp and Tim Burton while they were apart, did their own concept art of the Mad Hatter, with the former being watercolor, and it turns out neither were far off from the vision they wanted. While some characters were completely animated in CGI like the Cheshire Cat and the Dormouse, some were actually a hybrid of CGI and motion capture like Tweedledee, Tweedledum, and even the Knave of Hearts where the actors were on stilts. In the case of the Red Queen, they filmed Helena Bonham Carter in live action in a green screen room, and then in post-production, they increased her head anywhere from 50 to 75% its normal size, and had to do some tweaking when it came to her neck and jawline. Plus, in the case of Tweedledee and Tweedledum, what they did was they had Matt Lucas play one of them while his body double played the other, then they would film it again with Matt Lucas playing the other Tweedle. 
Some of the other roles a few of the actors play includes Mia Wasikowska, who after this movie also played Johnny from The Kids Are Alright, and Bertha Minix from Lawless. Johnny Depp, who has been in a lot of things, but most people know him best from his portrayal of Captain Jack Sparrow from the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. And even after the release of Alice in Wonderland, we played James Whitey Bulger from Black Mask, and even Jeller Grindelwald from the Fantastic Beasts film series. Lastly, we have Helen Bottom Carter, who also played Marla Singer from the 1999 film adaptation of Fight Club, Lady Tottington from Walls of Grom of the Curse of the Were Rabbit, and quite possibly her most recognizable role of Bellatrix Lestrange from the Harry Potter film franchise. Overall, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland as a standalone film is just mediocre, which is a shame because on paper you would think Tim Burton is an excellent choice to direct an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. While some of the visuals are rather good by 2010 standards, and I can't say I wasn't bored by it, the problem is the story itself is a super condensed Lord of the Rings which is probably the absolute last thing you would associate with Alice in Wonderland. I can see why people might enjoy this movie, much less like it, but I don't think this is worth buying at all. At best, I can see this as maybe seeing it on cable if nothing else is on, because I've seen far worse fantasy films. But when it's all said and done, this movie is a very mixed bag, with some things I either liked or at least was okay with, and some things that just didn't do it for me, even as a standalone film. I give Timber's Alice in Wonderland a 5 out of 10. This has been Michael Schomer, and not only will I see you all next time, but also, if you want to see reviews before they are made public, then visit my website at shomesreviews.com and support my Patreon at patreon.com slash